All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board. I'd like to call this meeting to order. My name is Rachel Zemberry. I'm the chair of the Redevelopment Board, and I'd like the other members uh, to please introduce themselves. Uh, Steve Revelot, good evening. Eugene Benson. Shana Corman Houston. Ken Lau. Thank you. And we have um, from the Department of Planning and Community Development, Director uh, Claire Ricker and Assistant Director uh, Sarah Suarez joining us this evening. Uh, so without further ado, let's move to our first agenda item, which is a review of the meeting minutes. Uh, the meeting minutes that we have to review today are loading. I'll describe them in a minute. Are from February 26, 2024, and we'll see if there are any additions or corrections from the board, starting with Ken. Yes, one on page three. Um, near the bottom of the page, it says Mr. Lau proposed mm -hmm. on that paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to insert a word at the last sentence. It says accurately show the surrounding buildings. Uh, I, I want to add the word massing. Accurately show the massing of the surrounding buildings. Show the massing. Yes. Because earlier I was talking about not, details not required, just the massing. Okay. Anything else? Nope. All right. Um, Shana? I have not. Jean? I was not at the meeting, so I have not. Fantastic. And uh, Steve? No amendments. Great. Is there a motion to approve as amended? So a motion. Uh, is there a second? Yes. We'll take a roll call vote, starting with Steve? Yes. Jean? Abstain. Shana? Yes. Kim? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. The meeting minutes are approved as amended for February 26. Right, that closes agenda item number two, and we will now uh, reopen the public hearing for the warrant articles for 2024 annual town meeting. Uh, these, uh, this is the second of our uh, nights of hearings as published in the schedule. Uh, we, uh, consistent with the past, the ARB will be hearing from article proponents and public wishing to speak on each of the articles as scheduled. This evening, we will be hearing articles 30 through 34. Applicants will have um, up to uh, five minutes to address the board. The board will then pose any questions to the applicants, followed by a period of open public comment. Note that the board will reserve final discussion and voting on each article until the last night of our hearings, which will not be this evening. So with that, what I would like to do is uh, move to Article uh, 30. You can give me one minute. I will open our document here. And for uh, each of these articles, uh, what I'd first like to do is turn it over to uh, Director uh, Claire Ricker to see if there are any items of introduction, starting with Article 30. Great, thank you. So we are moving into um, our five citizen petition articles this evening. Um, beginning with Article 30, which is shaded parking lots. Um, this was proposed by um, student uh, Susan Stamps and um, and ten, um, 10 community members. Great, thank you very much. Susan, here, there. Uh, uh, if you could sit right yeah. here, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And again, we'll try and reserve the um, front seating for the uh, applicants and people speaking uh, so that they can be picked up by the microphone for ACMI. Um, so, uh, what I'd like to do, if you could uh, please introduce yourself, um, name, address, and um, please uh, go ahead and introduce the article. If there are any slides you'd like us to show, please just let um, Claire know and we can advance right, them. Right, so you can advance for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm Elizabeth Carr Jones. I live at 1 Lehigh Street here in Arlington, um, and I'm here representing Green Streets Arlington. Um, I'm here to present Article 30 shaded parking lots, which would require that shade in the form of trees and or photovoltaic canopies be provided in Arlington's parking lots with more than 25 spaces. As the board knows, we originally championed this idea last year during the MBTA communities process. Oh, you already advanced it. Thank you. Oops. There, that one. Okay, thank you. Um, as a community, we recognize the benefits of a more livable environment 
green shady streets, great quality of life, and welcoming local businesses. We also recognize the importance of climate change resilience and seek out ways to reduce excess heat and flooding and improve our air quality. Arlington was designated one of the first green communities in Massachusetts way back in 2010. We've been weaving sustainability into the fabric of our community for a long time. Next slide, please. Now let me stress the urgency of now. Global temperatures are rising at an alarming rate, as illustrated in this graph from 1880 to 2020, and this ground level temperature map of Arlington from Mystic River Watershed Association's Wicked Hot Mystic Project shows a pattern of higher temperatures in red in areas with more pavement and fewer trees, and the lowest temperatures in our few areas of forest. Next slide, please. We're proposing that the town amend the zoning bylaw that pertains to parking lots of more than 25 spaces. This section currently requires landscape areas of at least 8% of the park paved area that are at least four feet wide. Our proposal adds that shade be provided by one or both of two methods. A is one shade tree for every eight parking spaces, each space within 20, or excuse me, 30 feet of the tree. Or B, solar canopies over parked cars to cover at least 50% of the paved parking lot. We found each of these amendments surprisingly close to home. The tree regulations are from Lexington's zoning bylaws. One tree for every eight spaces is a simple way to balance the area of the tree canopy with the pavement and the 30-foot distance requirement distributes the trees on the lot. Provisions are also included uh, to provide for the success of the tree and um, preserve existing ones. Um, the solar panel or photovoltaic canopy language is taken from Arlington zoning bylaws. It appears in the heat mitigation requirements for parking lots in our industrial zones where so solar panel canopies with 50% coverage are an available mitigation method. Both of these requirements are set up to provide for design flexibility and simple compliance calculations. All right, that's the next one. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> As an example, let's use the Whole Foods parking lot. On the left is an aerial view of what we have with our current zoning. 81 parking spaces, zero shade trees, and zero solar panels. I'll note that the perimeter trees you see are, are growing on adjacent properties. On the right is a visual simulation of what we could have had with this bylaw amendment. In this case, we've used a 50-50 combination of trees and solar canopy to get 80 parking spaces, five shade trees, and 192 solar panels. We're grateful for the board's substantial guidance in getting us to this point, where we believe this bylaw amendment would be beneficial and easily executed, and we respectfully ask for your support. Susan Thank you very here. much. <laughs> and I, I'm here. Support. <laughs> if there's questions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, anything else before we open this up to the board? Since I know you just I arrived. I was going to talk a little bit more about the specifics in case you wanted to know more about She's given us five minutes, and I think I may have taken oh, You still have a, about a minute and okay, a half left. Okay. If you wanted um, so to add anything So I else. sent you the uh, memorandum, which explained that we switched out the, the tree that we proposed to plant a parking lot to be I uh, cared for under a USDA Forestry Service standard versus what you had in a couple of other sections. And um, then I sent a copy of the, um, the main motion. And since that time, did you mention about Steve's want changes? No. Okay. So uh, we have consulted with, uh, Gene's been very useful, Steve has been great to work with, and they've helped us shape something that we hope the whole board will, or at least the majority will. Um, vote for. We have um, lots of questions. Steve had um, some technical amendments that he felt were necessary. I'm not sure Gene disagreed, but uh, agreed. You guys can talk about that. Um, but we did. Did you bring that memo? Did you we did have a memo of there were like five technical changes to like the use um, the, the use tables that 
these devices are separate. put in this, the solar panels are allowed. Great. So and is this one of the um, documents that was submitted? No. We just did this because we just talked to Steve this yeah. week. And we can provide it. Um, okay, if you could please provide it. Um, Electronically. So yes. 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 yes, and we'd like to yes. um, to publish that with the meeting materials. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, great, and we are at time. Unless yeah, so you no, we're good. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So what I'd, um, um, I know that you uh, joined us uh, just recently. Um, what I had mentioned was uh, the board will um, I'll, I'll ask each of the board members for any questions or clarifications. Um, final deliberation and voting will be at our at our next hearing um, night, not this evening, but um, we will certainly make sure that all of the board members ask any clarifying questions and if there's any discussion to be had after public comment, we will um, do so. Okay, so Ken, um, actually why don't we start with Steve since um, it sounds like you have um, had some okay. Questions around some of the, the technical items. So, um, Steve, if you could start us off with yes, any questions or points of discussion. All right, so I'll start off with a, a technical point for discussion. Great. Um, back when the industrial district regulations were rewritten, um, one of the things that, we, that was added to the bylaw was the definition for a, a, a ground mounted solar voltaic, solar voltaic system. Uh, if you go to the second slide, there's a picture of one. Right. Right, yeah, that. Yeah. And along with the definition was a uh, an entry in the use table that said this, this use is allowed in the industrial districts. Now, there is a different section in the bylaw that basically, and for my colleagues on the board, this is 522C, that basically says if anything in the use table that's not designated with a Y or a special permit is prohibited unless otherwise authorized by this bylaw. So my, you know, in order to make this more generally applicable, um, you know, my, my sort of technical feeling was that uh, there should be use table entries declaring that the use is allowed in the districts where um, it seems feasible and they've proposed R5, R6, R7, uh, B2A, B4, and B5. Or there needs to be some language um, you know, that satisfies the un unless, author unless otherwise authorized by this bylaw. But I didn't see anything in sort of like the 611, 6.1.11 tree that where these changes are proposed that would um, Know, expand on what's in the use table in an obvious way. So my su my suggestion to the proponents was to um, add a couple of entries to basically the existing row of the use table. And that was the memo that we brought If today. you, as a board, decide that, that that's necessary, we need to Great. provide. All right. Um, let's see. Steve, why don't you run through your your items, and I'll I'll keep a running list here. If that's, there's anything else, that's really the main one. Okay, great. Uh, Gene. Well, um, I saw this and I said I thought it was unnecessary because, as Steve pointed out, 5.2.2 says anything that's not uh, designated is prohibited unless otherwise authorized, and what the proponents do is basically is basically authorize. Um, the solar uh, canopy panels in parking lots. My concern with changing the use tables by putting the Y everywhere is it goes way beyond parking lots. Exactly. It would be the entire, every one of the zones. And number one, I think that's beyond the scope of this article. What I think may be more important is we haven't talked about whether that's a good idea, whether there should be standards for it, et cetera. So I think we're better off not having that, the Y in there, unless we're going to put in, in parking lots greater than 25 spaces, each one complicating it. I think it's better not to have it in, rely on 5.2.2, because this authorizes some of them. So that's where Steve and I have a difference about how to accomplish this. Okay. Yes. And just um, as one possible way of uh, you know, addressing that and you know, keeping the limitation to parking lots, 
um, you know, perhaps you know, for, you know, con for consideration, uh, in the last section of the main motion, 6111B6B, um, simply adding a, a something to the effect of this provision is applicable in the in part applicable for parking lots in the business and residential districts. You know, to me, that would that would satisfy the you know unless author would be the would satisfy the unless authorized by this by law. Uh, it's like belt and suspenders. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think it's necessary. But, but yeah, that's all. Thank you. Madam okay. Chair. Uh, Jean, any any other I, questions? No. Great, Shana. Um, so I just want to make sure that I'm reading the interplay between trees and solar properly, um, uh, because I know originally there was conversation about 50% shade from yes. one or the other, um, and with that taken out from um, on on behalf of or from the perspective of trees. Um, could you could you speak a little bit to the interplay um, of the combination? Um, you know, if you're going to do a combination of solar and trees, how does that work? What are you you know are are you trying to get to 50% shade coverage, or what are you trying to do? Okay. So we um, it, it requires planting of trees every eight. Um, yep. parking spaces which we graphed out and it looked like if you take any given area of parking spaces that is about 50% shade coverage. Mm -hmm. um, I, the thought with having solar panels we do, this, do, do the same thing, I have the same questions like how does that work but it seems that if it's a whole parking lot that's easy, 50%. Uh, but it's going to be, but if it's a part of a parking lot it's going to be some part of a parking lot. So whatever part of the parking lot it is, if it's a quarter of the parking lot, then 12.5% of that quarter of the parking lot would be shaded. I, I think it's actually, I think that works. So, so the notion. For example, yep. and, use and then the, the and then the trees every eight spaces and the rest of it. So the notion is essentially, if you can, if you are not achieving it all with with solar, then you go do the trees. Um, it, I don't know, to me didn't quite read clearly that way, but the, I follow you entirely with the idea. I don't know if it needs to be reworded a little bit for clarity, but, uh, but I'm with you on concept. Um, the one other piece I had a little, so, so I had a little concern about uh, the 30-foot requirement. Um, uh, I think a tree for every eight parking spaces is a is a fine standard for argument's sake. Um, uh, I tried to sketch out um, where a tree could go um, to be within 30 feet of of eight parking spaces, and there's really only one location that a tree can be. In. Um, it would be essentially if you have four parking spaces and then another, if you have parking spaces like this, the tree would have to be right there, um, which doesn't allow for a lot of flexibility uh, in the layout of your parking spaces. Uh, so might be something to consider that 30 foot. So increasing um, that might uh, not make sense. Increasing it or just looking at it. Um, to what you think it, it to allow flexibility for the location or possibly in the discretion of the yeah right the, the idea behind it though is 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 to distribute the trees mm -hmm. on the lot so they're right. not all planted in one place yes yes you know, so so that's the that's the thought behind it that's right and and my concern is not is not again the the concept behind it it's um, it's the actual technical, based on the size of parking spaces. I think it um, it may end up limiting the layout of parking lots in a way that um, is not intended. So um, that was 
on my head. I'm sitting in the front Great. row and I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll try it's to speak up. <laughs> no, not at all. It's a Is it's it a time com to have electrification in the 21st century, maybe so the people in the back could hear you. I have been told I have a very soft you, voice. I'll try it's, to it's speak up. It, it, it is the ARB needs to have proper. We are working with the resources that we have. Thank sorry you. Sorry to interrupt, but thank you. I mean, I'm in first thank row you very much. We no, understand I the appreciate, point. I appreciate that. I'll do my best to speak up. Anything else, Shana? That's all I have. Okay, great. Ken. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'll go back to my original question when you first came up here and presented this idea to us. I had last time asked um, how many uh, uh, properties would this zoning affect? You're saying only the large uh, properties with 25 or more parking spaces. Um, I find it hard to count it on my hands how many spaces there are in Arlington that, that has 25 parking spaces. I actually did a rough count. Perfect. Um, uh, and and you know it's, it's it's not precise, but somewhere in the vicinity of 70 parking sp parking lots in Arlington that I could count from Google Earth. You know, um, and. With over it's, it's, 25 spaces. Yes, it, it's, it's in that vicinity. Um, I, I, I won't say it's exactly that number, but um, uh, I, mean, I did go along. Business spaces, not not just residential. I mean, this is. Parking lots with 25 spaces. They're including there. residential. They're including, okay. Seven, yeah. All right. Um, also includes like the schools. And 70. Yeah. That's, wow. It's a lot of pavement. I didn't think it would be that much. That's existing. That's fine. Um, well, I gave you my feelings earlier about how uh, adding uh, trees to parking lots do add an ex extreme burden uh, on um, fostering uh, businesses developing in Arlington. Uh, I think we're trying to balance between the two. and. Uh, making it a mandate for having all these trees uh, puts an extra burden on it and may stifle uh, businesses. I think I, I said, uh, well, I said I'm personally, I am supportive of trees, but can we find all the areas that we can find low hanging fruit where we can put trees? And I did mention that uh, let's look at some street trees or in public areas where we can do that, where we can offset parking spaces and have uh, tree islands or having uh, uh, vegetation uh, vegetation at corners for uh, stormwater treatment before it goes into sore. All that stuff is something that if we are really truly concerned about heat islands, I think we should start with those first as an agenda as opposed to let's look at uh, new development and let's put a um, Put more criteria on it, so we um, so we hinder that. That was my opinion, and I expressed last time, and I still have that. Okay, and uh, that was one thing. And then um, when I look at this uh, illustration right here, um, I count four trees. You added, not five. <laughs> There's actually one in the corner. Um, if you look carefully, it's down by the could. It's it's um it's in the corner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. It it blended in. I, I, I'm not saying it, you didn't have five trees. I'm just saying I could find five trees. Yeah. Okay. When you guys did that, yeah. I know you guys are not professionals and all everything else. Did you guys do a a, a solar study on this? Because the way I look at these, all those trees surrounding that. Uh, solar field you got in, in, in the parking lot there, there might not be enough sunlight coming down on the solar panels to make it feasible. I'm not saying it is or isn't, but I'm just saying, can you take, I think that's something you take a look at. Uh, recently, I just had solar panel on my house, and the first thing they added is, they, they asked me was, what kind of shade trees you have around your house? Because if there's too much shade trees, it doesn't make any sense with solar panels there. So if we're going to do this combination that you talked about, we've got, we got to look more carefully about that and say, hey, you know, 
that's the uh, Whole Foods right on Mass Ave. And if we put those, well, I only see, let's say the trees, okay? I'm not gonna say numbers, okay? With those then and existing trees shaded for uh, 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 so many hours, it doesn't make sense with uh, solar panels there. So, you, so you're making a request on someone to do something that doesn't make any sense. That's why there's an option, but yeah. You know, I'm just, uh, these are all questions I have right now, okay? Uh, I'm not saying, you know, I, I just bring this up as, uh, as that. Uh, I think that's all I have for now. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I'm supportive of the notion, I'm just not supportive of putting an extra burden and also the fact of combination of the two that goes there, it just, it, 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 it com complicates. I think there's, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit which you can get for shade, for shade trees and and uh, getting rid of the heat islands that is not uh, focused on this one commercial uh, or residential uh, development there. And, uh, I, I, you know, I think it's a way of uh, in, uh, discouraging future uh, growth. And I'm sure I'm not that sure not your goal here. I think your goal here is to uh, so that's what I have. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, the question I have for you is around the selection of the um, standard that you have set, the USDA Forest Service Tree Owners Owners Manual standards. Um, and I know that we had when you came um, with this uh, pre-proposal. Um, several meetings ago, we had talked about whether or not we should include a specific standard or um, refer to other standards that may be set in town through, for example, the tree warden. Um, and, and the reason I asked the question around this particular selection um, is that we, we do try and not, um, in, the, in the bylaws, uh, specifically cite references because they change and are updated um, so regularly. So my, my question is um, whether this was kind of done in, in concert with the tree warden or if there was any discussion around, um, you know, potentially referencing standards which have been set by the town. Um, and, you know, if there is a way to do that without putting a specific standard into the section. Um, that uh, previously on, on the, the new uh, zoning section requiring the street trees planted every 25 mm -hmm. feet by developers, it says they'll be uh, cared for for 36 months pursuant to the American standards of nursery stock mm -hmm. standards, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and so I just carried that language over to ours, thinking, okay, well, that's what the ARB wants to see, and that mm -hmm. makes sense to me. But then I looked it up and I saw that that, that, that citation actually applies to pre planting uh, choice of stock mm -hmm. in, in the locations and things like that. And so we talked to the tree warden about it, it, A, did he agree that that's what this said, which he did agree, and B, did he have a suggestion as to what we could use instead of that? assuming that you would like a standard since you had a standard already in this other mm -hmm. section. And he came up with the uh, the USDA Forest Service Tree Owners Manual, which is an amazing document. And it's been around, I think, um, I think it's first, it, it, there's an old version on the website that was 2008, it's been updated, I think it was maybe 2015, 2018, 2020. Um, so it seems to be a very, um, you know, it, 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 he likes it. It seems great. I'm going to use it for my yard. And also, we have written in there, or other standard as the ARB may wish to use. So yeah, we, we kind of did the best we could there. You know, if you want us to take out that specific standard. Right. I mean, I, I, it's in multiple places, and I think the or other is, is cited once. And again, I'm trying to make this as um, 
simple as possible, yes. so that's why I asked the question. And I had suggested in my memo that it's probably too late, but it would be nice to amend that language in the tree every 25 feet to the, the tree or the manual standard versus the nursery. And again, they, they change regularly, so that this is okay. this is why I asked the question. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, any other questions from the board uh, before we open it up for public comment? Okay, so at this uh, time, um, I will ask any member of the public joining us this evening who would um, like to address article number 30 to please raise your hand. Um, once I call on you, you will have up to three minutes um, to address the board. Again, these are questions that will come to the board or um, you know, uh, your personal observations or opinions. They will not be directed directly to the uh, uh, applicants, the proponents of the article. Um, what I will do is uh, collect any questions that may come up. Uh, this is good for, for all of the, the articles. Um, and uh, we will then pose those to the, um, to the uh, proponents at the uh, end of, of public comment, unless there is something that starts coming up regularly that we feel would be helpful for clarification. Um, so any member uh, wishing to speak, you will have up to three minutes. And I would ask that you begin by uh, introducing yourself first, last name, and address. With that, uh, anyone wishing to speak on Article 30, please raise your hand. Uh, I, think, I think Chris did have his hand up first, so if you could please uh, join us here in the front. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, Adam Street. Um, you know, in general, I support this. I do have a number of questions, though, and would like some clarification you know, before voting on this as a town meeting member. Um, first, to, to Mr. Lau's question about um, how often this would apply, I think the question is over the past 20 years, how many parking lots would this apply to? How many developments would this apply to? Does anyone know that the answer? And I'll, I won't take the time to give it, you know, to listen now, but I, I would guess maybe only Sims, because this only applies to outdoor parking spaces, as I read it. And you know, the trend now is to build underneath the building whenever possible. Um, and related to this, since it only applies to 25, as I read the zoning bylaw, that means those developments are already going to be before you for environmental design review. Any re um, residential development of more than six units is before you. Any non-resident residential development of more than 10 units, 10 parking spaces, is, be is before you. Why can't you require this now? Um, also. I'm not sure that's the reason not to pass this, but I don't think this imposes really any more additional burden upon the developers, unless you're requiring more area for the trees to be in. As, and as I, again, as I read the proposed change, you're not requiring more area be set aside from the parking lot area than is currently required. It's just a matter of the type of vegetation that goes in there, whether it's trees or some other types of vegetation. Uh, so I think that it covers um, Oh, my comments. I, I'm a little confused, though, on the solar aspects of it, how the requirements in the parking lots will relate to any requirements on the roof of the buildings. And I wouldn't want to see the requirements that, if, the, if they do use the option of putting the solar panels in the parking lot, I don't want that to reduce the requirements on the roofs of the buildings. Uh, I don't think it does, but I think that's just clarified. Because there was some parenthetical comment in the proposed language about referring to the solar requirements in the industrial district, but it wasn't clear how those two would relate. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. We had another Can hand raised. Please. Uh, John Leone, Precinct 8. Um, this would only be applied uh, forward, not retroactively, correct? Correct. So if where in this um, example, they're losing its parking place. Would that negatively affect any of the other aspects of the potential building, such as square footage or um, uh, floor area ratio of anything like that, if they have this current square footage to do it, but with this new bylaw, would they be given a dispensation for that? That would be question that I would have. Mm -hmm. and, 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 
address that in your thought process or not, but that would be my only question. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yep. Uh, any other comments or questions from uh, people joining us this evening? Okay. With that, uh, we will close public comment on Article 30, um, and I will see if um, any member of the board, uh, we did answer that this would be going forward and not re retroactively applied. Um, the uh, question around um, how many parking lots this would apply to um, from from projects over the last 20 years, I, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know if um, you as the applicants have, have looked into that. If not, we can certainly for the deliberation um, look into that from through the planning department. But, but well, I'll see if you have the answer to that. Um, I mean, if there are 70-ish parking lots of that size, 25 or more in town, how many have been built in the last 20 years? I don't know, but we do know that, um, for example, the CBS parking lot is around just like maybe 27 spaces, so it would have applied to that. Right. So I, I mean, I, I think yeah. honestly that would be a helpful. You know, we we have some similar questions around: Is this the solution in um, search of a, a problem? <laughs> um, when when we uh, chatted the the first time that this that this came up, um, and I think that some of the the comments were in that same vein as our initial discussion: mm -hmm. How many um, projects recently would this have applied to? And um, um, Given that this is in front of us, one of you know any of these scale projects come in front of us. One of the items we we did speak about previously was the fact that one thing that developers are very willing to um, typically work with us on is are the landscaping plans, specifically the the species and the um, you know the the inclusion of trees, et cetera. Um, we we rarely seem to have have pushed back when um, when requesting those items. Not, not saying that we shouldn't have this in here, that I did want to just recognize for people who may not have been able to join us when um, this was originally in front of the board, that um, that was a discussion that we did have. Um, and I think the question around, would this negatively impact anything else like square footage? Um, you know, there are, there is a requirement in terms of the um, number of parking spaces um, that, that is calculated um, off of um, you know many different many different areas such as uh, the, the building size and um, again I think that there are are several different methods of um, reducing parking space requirements in terms of the TDM plans etc so I think that this would be one of many um, one of many parts of the calculation around the actual number of required parking spaces. But I wanted to see if any of the members of the board had um, any other comments related to public, uh, the, the questions that were recently raised or um, final thoughts for the proponents, starting with Ken. None of this time. Great, Shana? Hi, none. Jean? Yeah, as I, as I read this, I don't think it substitutes for the requirement for solar on roofs. It's an addition, not a substitute. Anything else, Gene? No. Okay. <coughs> Steve? Nothing here. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, so at this time, we will move to uh, the next item in our public hearing, which is Article 31, a zoning bylaw amendment related to adding five to seven winter street to the MBTA neighborhood district and I will turn this first over to Claire to see if there are any um, comments that you would like to make on behalf of the Department of Planning and Community Development. Sure, thank you. I only have one comment and that is that in our uh, MBTA committee's um, 3A compliance um, um, letter uh, we are required to notify EOHLC of any changes um, to the district and so EOHLC has been notified that this is a potential change an article um, and we are we can move forward um, at least as, in, as far as the state is concerned. Great, thank you very much and with that I'd like to turn it over um, to John Leone and uh, our other proponents. Yeah, I'm John Leone, I'm here with my uh, sister Suzanne Leone. And I'm sorry before you begin um, referencing um, the, the the challenges that some people in the back are having oh, okay. healing if you wouldn't mind just speaking up that would be 
John Appreciate Leone, it. Chrissy Kate, I'm here with my sister Suzanne Leone, Suzanne and I together uh, are the trustees of the AML Realty Trust and also my wife Pauline. The AML Realty Trust is a family trust uh, composed of myself and my siblings. My grandparents originally bought this house back in 1956. Six. And it's been in our family ever since, and Suzanne actually lives there, so it's not an investment for our family, it's a family home. Um, five to Seven Winter Street is one of the largest parcels in East Arlington, uh, being over 18,000 square feet. It's right now surrounded by a neighborhood multifamily district. Uh, as you can see on the chart, it's the house in yellow. The Dark shaded um, parcels are all now in the, the multifamily district. The light blue is the summit house. And over to the right, kind of a purpley color, is the Fox Library, which, as we all know, the town is now exploring to um, rebuild with the multifamily, multi story building above it, if feasible. So, our contention is we should have been included in the multifamily district. Um, on the first time around, I brought this before town meeting last year, and it failed by four, six votes. Um, I've spoken to several of the town meeting members who voted against it, and they now can see what our thought process was. Um, if we, if all of the other buildings around us built to the allowed height of four or five stories, and on Mass Ave, that row of stores, which we refer to as basically taxpayers, went to six stories, we would be surrounded by multifamily um, apartment houses and we would never be able to do anything to the house, not that we have any plans to do so, but it would be forever precluded from doing that. And if the bottom of the L, if the other property owners on, that, on Winter Street or Cleveland approached us and wanted to buy that little portion to increase their lot size, it would be of no benefit to them because it, it, it's not in the district. Um, if we wanted to, we recognize the house is on the National Historic District list, but so is number 13 and 15, those big parcels down Winter Street um, that are two houses down from us. They're also included. Um, I asked both the Arlington Historic Commission and the planning department, if they had a comprehensive list, I don't think we really have one of all the buildings on it. So for all I know, or for all we know, other buildings may be included in the multifamily district. I think that might have been the original reason to leave us off, but I don't think it's a valid reason just because two other houses on the same street are on. So we would, we're here to ask that we be included within the district. Again, not that we have any plans to do anything. Uh, we like the house, we like the barn out back, but we want to preserve our rights for the future. And if we ever decide to sell it as a family, that whoever buys it would have those rights preserved. Great. Yeah. Anything else? Um, no, I don't think so. Well, you talk, none of your neighbors. Oh, none of my, yeah, I guess the notes went out, but no one has approached me to ask about it, but. Yes, okay. 164 cards went out um, to the neighbors. We haven't heard anything back. That would include every, all the abutters, everybody in the summit house, because it's a condo now. And I think she said the, it was a radius of 500 feet? 300. 300 feet? Yeah. Yeah, so we had to send it to everybody. Um, well, actually, Claire's department did. We just gave it the stamps. Great. But we've heard nothing from anybody, either pro or con. So Great. I don't really think there's much uh, pushback from the neighbors. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we'll turn it over to the board for any questions or uh, comments, starting with Ken. Um, to answer your earlier question, um, yes, we left your property off because it was historical. Right. Um, we were going to guidelines, or we did the MBT communities, uh, that we were going to leave historical buildings alone. Uh, and 
so that's why it was left out. Uh, I realized you brought up at the last meeting that there were a, a historical building down the street. We missed that one. Mm. Okay, so uh, two. Two. Is this <laughs> <laughs> on just our street. There was quite a few properties we we're, were looking at at the time, trying to get this uh, going and. You know, the boundaries were going in and out from Mass Ave and a whole bunch of other things that we're trying to deal with, trying to just address everybody's issues as best we could. And uh, I'm just letting you know what our initial intent was. It was not sure. to fight you guys at all by leaving, oh, we appreciate that. leaving you guys out, okay? It was not our intent. Um, but as far as uh, uh, giving you guys ability, I have no issues with that. I think it, it gives you relief, uh, especially the business districts, which are really, really shallow there. There's really not much you can do there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it actually as a deterrent for doing anything there, but what's there now, the way it's situated. Because, because uh, the front spaces along Mass Ave is so shallow. You can't do much of anything there. Uh, you really, need to, you really need to combine spaces to actually do something, which may or may not happen. I'm not saying that. Right, right. So uh, I have no you know, issues with that. It's just, uh, and you, you talked to the Historic Commission? I, well, I spoke to um, Joanne Robinson. And what was her comments back on this? She, she just made me aware, which I already knew, that there is a um, anything that happens to that house, not the property, the house, has to go through them, and uh, and they would have to approve any changes. And uh, if anyone in the future ever decided they wanted to knock it down, there is a two-year demolition delay. That's that sort of thing. And being on the National Historic Register, there's another overview over lay of additional requirements to keep the house nice, mm -hmm. which we have that we can actually just put in a roof on it, so we're not going anywhere. Uh, could I ask another question? Yeah. Of, was it historic, was it already historic uh, registered when you bought the building, or no. it became that way while you owned the building, so you had the option well, to do so or not do so? No, we, they, my grandparents bought it in 56, and I think it was around the mid-70s. Um, I think I provided the um, registration materials to the you know, Clare's Department. Um, and I remember discussing with my dad prior to his passing, and he just said when it happened, it just happened. They were never really told it was going to happen. It just all of a sudden one day they were informed, you're now in the historic register. There's no public hearing or discussion. It just got submitted and approved. It's on the historic register because it's a classic shingle style Queen Anne Victorian. So it's for architectural purposes, not that someone historic lived there or something. Mm -hmm. so. Any other questions? Okay, Shana. Um, so, so. Uh, Claire, I appreciated the information about uh, submitting um, information to the state and a just a quick feedback question on the, or follow up question on that. Uh, uh, does the state need to approve any changes to MBTA communities of this nature or is it simply notification? It's simply notification. I think what the state is looking to preclude is any um, uh, any minimizing of the sure. district or, or anything like that. I don't, I, honestly, I think they're probably thrilled or, or ambivalent about adding properties. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I have nothing further that Kim hasn't already touched on. Thank you very much. Gene. Yeah, I, I have no problem with your proposal. I do have some questions about um, the process. So the zoning bylaw requires two types of notice, and I just want to make sure they were both done. 
The first says, and we haven't seen this, the petition, which is what you filed, um, show that copies of the petition have been sent by registered or certified mail to all owners and immediate abutters of the land referred to in the petition. And then the department sends it out by first class mail to the wider group. What I would need to see to vote favorably on this is the notice of registered or certified mail to all the owners and immediate abutters of the land referred to in the petition. So that's, it's a two-part requirement. I mentioned this yeah. when you were in a so, few months ago, that so I have this a question. is important. Um, we send the, 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 basically, you want to send the proposed warrant article to the abutters. What, what this says is, is um, when a petition for a change in the zoning map is filed, which is what you're doing, mm -hmm. such petitions shall show that copies of the petition have been sent by registered or certified mail to all owners and immediate abutters of the land referred to in the petition. So it's one, right? Then before this hearing, the department sends out first class mail to a much larger piece. So I'm feeling like we need to see the um, registered and certified mail piece as the first piece of that, so. So I, I just have a question regarding that. The, the Summit House, we send it to the condo association or to each of the individual owners? It says to all, all owners and immediate abutters of the land. And okay. you know, someone came in a couple of years ago mm. with, with a petition to rezone, I think, two or three parcels on Massachusetts Avenue. And he, was, he complained a little about the requirement, but he did that. Oh, no, I, we have he no said, problem doing yeah, it. I just said, I'm said it. So we, we need to, I need to see that. No, we have, I have no problem sending it out to the abutters. This, it, but the, you're the looking for the house. definition. That, that's something that um, perhaps we can have Mike Cunningham um, absolutely. clarify for you Cunningham. very quickly to yeah. make sure that we get that done. Correct anything procedural, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yep. I have no, we have no problem sending out the petition yeah, so to the butters. It's just a procedural yeah. piece. I would like to be done correctly. Okay. Yeah. That's it. We'll that's all that I Thanks, uh, So we're going to confirm a town council on, there it is. Association or individual owners. Okay, Steve. Um, so this looks. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, I have no further questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't either. I appreciate that you spoke with the historic commission as we discussed. So mm -hmm. thank you for doing that. Okay. Okay. Um, to, if I might just address Ken's point, those front property owners on Mass Ave, they're built right up to the property line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, uh, I think I walked that site. Don't they? Don't the back doors open onto your property? No. There's, yeah, there's, there's no, no back, back door. Doors. There's, there's windows. There's yeah. windows, but they're all oh. ripped up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Except for the yoga studio. Yeah, the yoga studio. Hmm. Okay. All right. So with with that, um, we'll open this item, uh, Article 31, up for public comment. Anyone uh, wishing to speak, please uh, raise your hand. Please, if you'd like to come forward, and um, if we could just. Um, make space, uh, one chair for uh, anyone coming up. Thank you. And again, as a reminder, um, you will have up to, uh, please, uh, three minutes to speak. Please introduce yourself by your first, last name, and address. Sure, uh, my name is Shelley Dean, and I live at 7 Cleveland Street. Um, and I have mostly questions. Um, and in general, I am supportive of um, increasing the density of housing options in Arlington. Um, some of my questions have to do with, and, and just in, in terms of comments that I've had from some neighbors, they're not familiar necessarily with what is allowed under the neighborhood multifamily sub-district. Um, so some neighbors mentioned to me, oh, they're getting it approved as a two-family. And I said, no, I don't think that's right. So just um, there may be some information that would be helpful to um, explain to neighbors. Um, 
my question really had to do with the fact that when I went online and I looked at what I thought was the most recent MBTA communities map, it differed slightly from the map up here. So that um, on the L-shaped section, those two sort of short, short um, parcels, which um, I don't know how to describe them better than yeah, exactly those two, were not, um, were not on the map that I saw, were not designated as neighborhood multifamily subdistrict. And similarly, I think the lot right next to the Fox Library on Cleveland Street is also not um, on the on the town's map for MBTA communities is not um, in in gray. <laughs> so um, so my question is whether this is whether this is the accurate map or the one on this on the town's website is and. Just my concern was that, and this is not my mm. personal concern because I'm not immediately abutting the site. I'm on the other side of Cleveland Street. But if I was, in fact, either living at what I'm speculating is 9 and 11 Winter Correct. Street, and what I'm speculating is maybe 6 or 8 Win um, Cleveland Street, I'm not quite sure what the numbers mm -hmm. are. Um, the, that there would be a tall building on one side, uh, an allowable neighborhood um, multifamily subdistrict on the other side, but the property in between would not be. So um, I just want to, you know, if you can clarify that, sure. that would be really helpful. Great. Thank this, you very this much. This should be the most updated map that we have. If there is a map that doesn't, that is, um, that, that does not match this on the website, we would change it. Okay, because the map on the website does say final. So, does, okay. so I was like, huh. <laughs> we will, we will, um, we will ensure that that is uh, aligned. That okay. The, that the maps match. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry that you discovered that. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I just, I, I just feel mm -hmm. like the, you know, neighbors should, should really understand okay. what, what's happening. And, and I guess just the, the last comment I would make, which is neither here nor there, is um, I agree with the comment earlier that. Um, uh, that you raised, which is the properties on Mass Ave are just so shallow that um, those, it seems really unlikely that those will be developed as taller buildings unless they're combined with the, with the properties right next to them. Mm -hmm. so, just, but in general, I, I think density makes sense. So I just want to make sure that we're not going to create these valleys in Great. between all the buildings. Thank you. It's not Thank you very much. Uh, any other uh, members of the public looking to uh, comment on Article 31? Thank you, Madam Chair. Crystal Reddy, I'm sure you can. I just have some um, procedural questions about this. Um, I was one of those town meeting members who didn't know how to vote for it, vote on it, and uh, so I voted with the board. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question, and, and the reason I did that is the is the board at the 11th hour dropped all of Mass Ave and East Arlington from the MBTA communities um, district. And the rationale was that that was all going to be rezoned um, to some other, for some other purposes. And my assumption was that the reason this parcel was dropped is that it would have been included with that rezoning for the rest of East Arlington, given the sh uh, shallowness of the lots in front of it. Um, and yet I haven't heard anyone talk about the rezoning of all of, of, of all of that part of Mass Ave. And I'm wondering, my question is, is that going to occur? And if so, should this parcel be part of that rezoning rather than part of the MBTA communities? So that, that's one question. Um, the other question is everyone's talking about MBTA communities um, bylaw change is a done deal, but it has not been approved by the Attorney General. And if I read the legal notice and the advocate recently correctly, it may not be approved if anyone objects to the defect in the hearing notice that the Attorney General wrote about. So I'm wondering, is it even possible to amend a zoning bylaw that hasn't yet been changed? 
it's not on the books. And I don't, I don't understand how we can amend it. So I, I'll leave those questions up to you, but it seems strange to me that when the bylaw has not yet changed, you know, we can go through this process of amending it when it doesn't even exist on, you know, in, in, in an approved form yet. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Uh, please. Hi, um, I'm Jerry Grady. Um, I live at uh, 11 Winter Street. Hi. Hi. Um, and this is more of a question, and maybe this is not the right format, but I just, I'm trying to understand. Um, I know you guys don't plan on doing anything with it. Um, if you did sell it, I guess I'm trying to understand what could be done if it if it passes and it's rezoned. What are the implications of that in terms of what the options are for like a future buyer? And we, we can certainly, again, um, top line the uh, MBTA neighborhood district yep. um, for you. Um, any other questions? Again, I'm keeping a list of all the questions and we'll yeah, answer yeah, those. No, that's, that's okay. I mean, I know what that, but I just didn't know what the implications were in sure. terms of design and okay. heights and stuff like that. Great. Anything else? Okay. No, that's it. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Um, so with that, we will close public comment for Article 31. Um, Claire, it seems like there are some questions around the status of the um, the submitted MBTA communities article. So perhaps if you could uh, give an update on the approval status and the EL. Sure. Yes. So <coughs> Mr. Lurie is correct. There was a procedural flaw related to um, the um, notification of the, uh, you know, the, the Warren articles um, last fall. Um, the Attorney General's Office is working through that right now, um, going through their process, and they're working with the town clerk and with town council right now to um, come up with a resolution. Great, thank you very much. Um, let's see, so uh, regarding uh, Steve, um, if I could ask you just to give a quick um, recap of what is developable on the, the properties for the MB, uh, the neighborhood communities. So the neighborhood multifamily districts would be, um, if my memory serves me correctly, they would be multifamily homes, which is three or more dwellings per building, uh, at a height of three stories, uh, with setbacks of, I believe, I don't remember if it was 15 or 20 feet in front. 15. 15, or 15 feet in front, 20 feet in the rear, and a total of 20 feet on the sides. So Thank you very much. Roughly, not too far out of scale with what's there. It's a, it's a big two and a half story. Thank you very much. Well, you redefined a floor as 30% bigger than a floor. We're not here redefined. to debate the, um, the, the piece. Excuse me, we're, we're not here to debate. We are giving a top line summary. Uh, excuse me, we are not here to debate. We are here to provide a top line summary. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, and then the, the last item um, that I'll uh, mention, there was a question around when we are looking at um, the uh, rezoning. We left out, uh, we um, decided to omit uh, the business districts in um, Arlington Heights Business District and East Arlington, um, as well as Arlington Center. Uh, we will be uh, starting with the uh, redistricting of Arlington Heights Business District. Um, the uh, target date for that is the uh, Springtown meeting of 2025, and uh, East Arlington uh, will, will follow um, uh, Arlington Heights. Great. Uh, so any other questions or co uh, com for the applicants or um, comments from the board, starting with Steve? Uh, nothing here. Jean? Nothing. Gina? Nothing. And Kim? Oh. All right. So with that, we will uh, close um, the uh, this portion of the hearing for Article 31. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very you much. Board. All right, uh, we will now move to the uh, zoning bylaw amendment. For, uh, excuse me, Article 32, the zoning bylaw amendment related to tra traffic visibility. And I will first turn it over to Director Ricker for any uh, comments. Great. Thank you. Um, no comments on um, this article. It was inserted at the request of Caitlin Monahan and um, 10 registered voters. Um, just taking a look at corner lots and visibility um, related. 
Great. Thank you very much. And um, we'll turn it over to you for um, up to five minutes of introduction. Great. Thank you. I'm Caitlin Monaghan, 43 Highland. Thanks so much for giving me the chance to talk could to you, you about this today. Could you speak up, please? I'll, I'll try. <laughs> Just um, in the interest of full transparency, my lot is one of the ones that would be directly impacted by this warrant article in the past. Next slide, please. Um, so the goal of warrant article 32 is just to amend section 5312, which ensures traffic visibility by putting restrictions on the placement and height of buildings, fences, and vegetation. It does this in two subsections, one section A, which ensures visibility over corners, and section B, where it ensures visibility from, from driveways. In section A, the way it does this is it, it defines this triangle that's 20 feet by 20 feet, so a, a basically a 200 square foot area in most cases, and it says that nothing above three feet can be there unless it's a shade tree. Next slide, please. For the um, section 5 through 12B, it has a similar sort of structure in that it has a zone where there are limitations. In this case, the zone is the five, the five feet in front of the property, and the limitation is a limitation of two and a half feet in height. However, Section 5312B also adds one additional element that's absent in 5312A, which it, is it, it includes the possibility of an exception. And it uses the language that this, um, this limitation is in place unless it can be shown that the vegetation or structure will not restrict visibility in such a way as to hinder the safe entry of a vehicle from any driveway to the street. And if that's the case, you can go above the highland. So I think we can all agree that there are a lot of types of fences and vegetation that would be completely unsafe if you put them either next to a corner or next to a driveway. Next slide, please. Um, however, there are also many fences that are more than three feet in height but don't really include the view of traffic. And under the current bylaws, you would be allowed to put these next to a driveway, but you're not allowed to put them next to a street corner. Next slide, please. This is a problem, in my opinion, because it discourages the use of fences that are an adequate height to actually protect children and pets. So if we look at what the Massachusetts Department of Early Education and Care stipulates for child care centers in the state, they require that there be a sturdy permanently installed barrier, which is at least four feet in height, if there's a hazard nearby, such as um, a busy street. If we look at our own Arlington Zone bylaws, there's a requirement that if you have a hazard like a swimming pool, that needs to be surrounded by a fence that's five feet high. Next slide. So my proposal then is to update section 5312A with language that's adapted from 5312B in order to just add the words, unless it can be shown that the building structure or vegetation will not restrict visibility in such a way as to hinder the safe transit of a vehicle through the intersection. And in doing that, I think we can completely preserve the original intent of the bylaw, but also allow fences that are tall enough to protect children and pets. Thank you, that's all I have. Great, thank you very much. Um, I will uh, turn it over to Steve to start with any questions or comments. Uh, this is, um, that was a good observation. Uh, you're right, there is, there are two sections of the, or those two sub subsections, ostensibly deal with traffic visibility, and one has a provision um, that you know, makes exceptions if you can demonstrate maintaining sight lines and the other doesn't. Um, I think your proposal is entirely reasonable. I have no further questions. Great, thank you, Jean. I'm just curious, who makes this decision? I mean, if, if you're going to put up a fence that's four feet tall or, or bushes or whatever, who gets to make this decision? Who, who's in charge of this? That's, I couldn't figure that out. And if we're going to add, and I'm not necessarily opposed to the concept, but if we're going to add something to the zoning bylaw that says, unless it can be shown such and such. I want to know who gets to look at it and say, yeah, you're right. And I think we need to know that. And you know, I don't know, Claire, whether the um, building department has to approve fences and bushes, because if they don't, we're in no man's land here as to what to do about this. Mm -hmm. All right. So the question is, does, does the building department, it's, it's not planning. Yeah. That, that I know. Right? Yeah. So I, I, think it's, I think it's important to know that because if we don't know the answer, we need to write something that indicates how this is actually going to be processed. Gene, isn't it if it's a zoning article, it's zoning issues that it's the building commissioners yes. that are right responsible to enforce, to enforce well, that? Well, we just need to um, understand that. Okay. We should probably So we can follow up with Inspector Champa yes. unless you... Absolutely. 
already spoken with Inspector Champa? No, I, I figured you all would know much better than I do because whatever it is in Section 5 through 12B, that's what I'm envisioning for 5 through 12A. Fair so enough. I, I think we should talk to Okay, um, we can Mr. do that Champa before yeah. our next and meeting. figure out how this would work. Because you don't usually need a permit for a non-structural fence, right? So right, that right. would be under fine. six feet, right? right? So we need to, and I think Mike needs to understand this is coming and what it would mean for him. That's all I have. Good observation. Thank you. Shana? Um, I guess my only other observation or question is, uh, is there... Um, is there a distinction between fences and vegetation that would need to be, or that should be made um, uh, just because the visibility um, with fences and vegetation are by, uh, you know, by nature very different. And, um, and it's very easy for vegetation to get out of hand pretty quickly, um, unintentionally. Uh, We've done a lot of talking, I think, about about um, inspectional service, uh, inspectional services, and compliance. And can we hire someone to um, to do compliance work and um, and come to the conclusion? I think that that someone walking around and looking at the height of bushes is, is unlikely to happen. Which is probably where it may have originated from, knowing That's that right. compliance was a challenge. That's right. Right. Um, I also just want to add one more thing where you say that uh, unless proven that, uh, that the fence doesn't impair vision, uh, that's so subjective. Uh, you know, going back to Jesus, who's going to uh, view this? But also, that person may change from time to time. And now all of a sudden, oh, well, this worked before, and it just doesn't work now. So I think I would suggest tightening up a little bit, saying uh, anything above three feet needs to be 50% uh, uh, viewable or open. I, I'm not sure what the right, right word is, but uh, something like that along those lines. I think they have that in, in, uh, uh, in the biological Okay. Yeah. And uh, I also would I also would encourage you. My apologies. I would encourage you to maybe, if you're concerned about uh, safety in the residential corners, to maybe hook up with the uh, uh, tree committee there <laughs> and look and look about some of the adding some storm dry, uh, storm uh, rain gardens at the corners. Are you aware of those? Yeah. Um, uh, that it, would also help you uh, the safety of <coughs> the corners there because now you're shortening the, uh, the crosswalk on the street and now there's a garden up there that's lower that would allow more visibility and more safety because now I'm not saying no to that, but now you have more of that chamfer and the sidewalk and the rain garden is that much more. I'm just encouraging if that's something you're serious about, I would say, look, maybe that's something you also might want to champion. I was trying to keep this as completely narrow as possible by changing I, I, yep. almost no language and directly copying from one region to another. I agree the likelihood of there being vegetation or a structure that is transparent that seems very unlikely, like a plexiglass shed, what would that even be? But um, I wanted to just Stick to, I assumed that the original language was acceptable to actually think the last, there's a hidden slide at the end. There are a few things, um, oh, okay, it's just, it's too hidden. All right. Um, yeah, I think there are several things we could tighten up in the language of the zoning bylaw. There is um, the way that the corner is defined. It talks about the intersection of tangents in a way that perhaps I don't remember calculus, but I don't think that means what that seems to think it means. Um, also, some language about, you know, above the plane of the curb rate, and there are things that I think could be said a little bit more clearly, as well as things to find, like I love the idea of 50% like, transparency. Um, because right now with the driveways, you 
it's just completely subjective and enforced by who knows who. So. You are not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anything else before we open up for public comment? Yeah, I'd like to ask you to think about this. It, it seems like the thing you're interested in is being able to put a fence up. And you can have fences that you can see through. So rather than what you've done, and I understand you copied it from somewhere else in the zoning bylaw, we could ask whether that was done very well, but we won't go there. It, it might be easier if you said, except for a see-through fence. Then we wouldn't have anybody having to make a decision or anything like that. And you could put up, you know, a see-through fence. Or a fence with X percentage yeah, or more something visibility. Like that. And, and right. it's just, and that, you know, that might be a really easy way to fix this. Sorry, didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, it, might, it might be a lot easier if it just said, instead of what is in here now, if it just says, except for a fence that you can see through or 50% transparent or something like that, then we don't have to get judgments made or anything like that. And the reason it's helpful is, is if you look at the zoning bylaw, structure is defined to include a fence. Um, among other things. So that's why I'm suggesting just saying, except for a transparent fence, or we can figure out what the language would be. And that might be the easiest way to accomplish what we want. Any other comments? Is that or would, questions? Would that, work for you? that would certainly, yeah, I, like I said, I don't foresee any transparent other structures or fences right. vegetation. So it seems we, unlikely. We can figure out how to do that. Would, would it be possible for us to also fix 5312B in the same way, or is that going to, like, because that has the same. Let's concern. look at the language. Bless you. you Let's look at the language of your main motion. Yeah. You referenced 5.3.12A in your. Um, in your yeah. article, so I. Don't believe that 5.3. Not that I don't think it should change, but I don't know that we could. And Jean, you're always a great arbiter of this. Um, I don't know that 5.3.12b would fall under within scope. Is how I'm reading this. I would, Madam Chair, I would be inclined to agree with you. Yes. Yeah. Me too. Okay. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, any other comments before we open this up for public comment? Maybe, maybe I can share a proposal with her. Would you Not be open right to now. working with, with email you in a few days Thank or you. something? Yes. Great. And would you also be able to reach out to Inspector Champa, or well, would won't you prefer need him that? If we just do the I think it would be okay. good to let him sure. know yeah, as well. Okay, I'll great. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Open it up to public comment. Okay, great. Um, so at this point, we will open up, um, uh, open this up for public comment for Article 32 related to traffic visibility. Anyone wishing to speak, please. I see you. Um, anyone wishing to speak, please uh, raise your hand. Um, you will have up to three minutes to speak, and please uh, uh, begin your comments by introducing yourself by first, last name, and address, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, I'm Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road, and a town meeting member. Uh, I put a fence up at my house when I moved into it. It is not on a corner, and I learned some of the rules for fences. Um, I, I would make an observation that these nice fences that may be on the recording or maybe folks here can see, I believe are all three or very close to three feet or less. So they're not representative of a, of a fence that is high, certainly not on a corner either. You can see it in some of the cases anyway. So uh, I'd like to make the observation that I believe the rules the town has seem very sensible and they are by right at the moment, which is you don't need a permit, you just have to follow the rules. I believe my house was two and a half feet in front of my house to the street. And then on the sides, you can go up to six, but you have to rise up. Uh, if you want to go around those rules, I believe you come and see the ZBA or the ARB, and that also seems to be a very logical and appropriate way for an applicant such as the one who has this, this article to, 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 to make changes, to ask if it's okay. 
And when one takes the needs of the applicant, uh, which, which may be measurable about dogs or whatever other reason, that's important. But it's very important that thousands of people who use the streets, the sidewalks, bicyclists, children, pedestrians, other drivers, also have their needs met. And so I hope that you'll consider that we already have good laws for how you put a fence up in Arlington, including on the corner, and that the applicant can come and get a variance potentially if it makes sense for the applicant's needs versus the needs of all the thousands of people who live here and safely have to use the area around our houses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else uh, who has a, a comment or question on Article 32? Thank you, Madam Chair. Crystal Reddy, Adam Sweet again. Claire, could you bring up the slide that shows the triangle um, for the area that this would apply to? But then, yeah. this one? Yeah. So if you look at the slide on the left, um, I believe the applicant is has presented in a way that is not the way that the bylaw is interpreted, or at least has been historically interpreted. And the bylaw uses weird language that says it talks about between the property lines of intersecting streets. Traditionally, that has been, as I understand it, has been the curb line of the street, not the street right of way, which is shown there, the inner lines of the sidewalks. And if you go back to the zoning bylaw, before it was requodified, there are a lot of illustrations about how it should be interpreted. And if you look at the illustration that corresponds to this, it's pretty clear to me that they were measuring that 20 feet, not from the, not from the right of way line, but from the curb line. And once you do that, that triangle becomes a lot smaller than what is shown on this illustration. Um, and, and for that reason alone, I think this, this change is not necessary. Um, as for the question of enforcement, I've had experience uh, with that. It has been the building inspector. Um, I objected once when a stockade fence was put right up to the sidewalk next to a driveway, and he went and had the people you know, reduce it um, in accordance with the bylaw. I don't think the exception to bylaw, to my knowledge, has never been applied. Because once the building inspector gets that objection, he doesn't say, well, maybe, maybe you could show that it, it, it doesn't affect anything. He just enforces it without, without even considering the possibility of that inspection. So I don't think the change as proposed would actually do anything anyway. Um, I think the bylaw as it stands, as Mr. Uh, Wagner said, is, is, is correct as it is. And while I appreciate that the applicant may like their dog. I think the importance of the importance of safety to pedestrians far outweighs the minor increase in area that the dog would have to run around in a fence, fenced uh, place. Um, and I can't read my own writing. But the other thing I was going to say is certainly if it oh I don't want this apply to buildings either. And the way that the change is written, it would allow buildings in that area. Um, you know, based on the exception. I don't think that's appropriate. Certainly if somebody's just sticking, you know, a plexiglass, um, you know, banner on top of the fence to raise it up another foot or so, it shouldn't be objectionable. But in general, I don't think there's anything wrong with the bylaw as it stands now. And certainly as a town meeting, I would not support this in its current form. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public wishing to speak on this article? Okay. With that, we will uh, close. We'll, we'll, we'll come back and we'll, if you wanted to, to, to I join wanted us. To respond to Mr. I wanted to respond to Mr. I wanted to ask her a question. Sure. Let's, let's start with Jean's question and then um, we can so go So Ms. Silveretti says that your triangle is not in the right place. Why do you think that's the right place for the triangle? Uh, and, and, and I'm sorry, if you could, if you could <laughs> please come up here. I need the microphone to be able to pick you up. Thank you so much. Yes, I agree that the intersection of the property lines, I, I don't know why you would, there, it says the intersection of the property lines of the street. I couldn't tell if that meant parallel with the street. If that's the case, why not say parallel with the street? Um, and so I deferred to asking Steve mm -hmm. which of it, I, I gave him two pictures and said which one is it, and just went with that. Great, thank you. Um, and, and Steve. I, I, my interpretation is was the one shown on the left, and by virtue of the language property lines, property lines don't intersect the street, but they do intersect the sidewalk. So it was whatever the I interpreted as, you know the, you know, the triangle formed by where the property lines intersect. 
Thank you. I will ask uh, Inspector Champa how it is. Thank you. This. Great. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks. And did you have, um, was oh. that the clarification you were hoping to make? That was one of them. And then to Mr. Wagner's point, um, my intention, yeah, I think I maybe have been a fair, my, my primary intention is not just to fence the yard for my dog, because if I wanted to do that, there are a gazillion non-compliant fences and I would have just put up a fence. My intention was to make a bylaw that would be fair and equitable and applicable to everyone. Fair. Thank you very much. Uh, any other uh, questions for the applicant or comments from the board, starting with Steve? Um, no. I do know that you know, in terms of non-conformities, non fences around corners happen to be a common one and nothing further. Thank you. Gene? Yeah, you could never get a variance to violate this. Wouldn't happen. Um, Shana? Nothing further. And Ken? Um, just one comment. Uh, yes, uh, the chamfer that's shown in that corner there, the yellow line there, I thought that that's what she wanted. I know that the line of sight in, in the past, I believe, was front of curb to front of curb where it intersects. And that is the viewpoint for traffic and not blocking it. So uh, I thought she just wants to increase that and make something larger. I might be wrong. Uh, again, I think this is what Jean is going, one of the things Jean is clarifying with Inspector Tampa. Okay. Any other comments? All right. Please. To that point, um, I would, um, as a, just a counterpoint to Mr. O'Reilly's excellent point, that yes, this triangle would almost not even intersect with the yard if it were at the corner. I think that would in a lot of ways make a lot more sense because why would the safety margin be dependent upon how big the sidewalks are. Um, that said, I do think there is a need for something along the lines of this warrant article regardless, because there are plenty of streets that don't have any sidewalk at all, right. and it would still be necessary to do something to treat those comparably to other properties. I could understand the objection, potentially, that by putting up a fence, if there is no sidewalk, that this might also be a hazard for pedestrians. I think that if that's the case, we should concern consider why we currently allow fences up to that line as long as they're less than three feet in height. I don't think if a car's coming that I want to dive into a three-foot hedge, that that would be particularly safer um, than having the four-foot fence. Thank you. Uh, all right, so with that, we will um, end uh, public comment for Article 32 and move to our next article, which is Article 33. A zoning bylaw amendment related to rear yard setbacks in the business districts, and I will turn it over to um, Director Ricker for any uh, initial comments. Um, no comments from the department on this um, amendment. Um, Great, thank you very much. Um, if you could introduce yourself first, last name and address, you'll have up to uh, five minutes to present your proposed article. Okay. Uh, my name is Andy Greenspun. I live at 89 Palmer Street. Um, here's the warrant article language just for reference to adjust rear yard setbacks requirements for uses of four or more stories in the business district. Um, next. This is the actual change. This is, if you recall it, um, the special fall town meeting last year, we simplified the ways to determine the um, setbacks that used to be for, for rear and setbacks in the business district it used to be some sort of formula involving length plus height divided by six among other things so it was simplified to this um, sort of these sort of definitions here um, but at the time I noticed a little too late that um, if you go from with the current existing language if you go from three stories to four stories the rear yard setback for all the stories has to go when the budding residential has to go from um, 20 feet all the way to 30 feet. So the proposed motion here is just that for the first three stories, the rear yard setback stays at 20 feet, and then for four or higher stories, the rear yard setback has to be 30 feet for those stories. Uh, next. Uh, here's the most basic image to sort of convey the point. Um, this is the current zoning, so if you have a three-story business building next to a residential. If you go up to four stories, you have to pull the entire building back. Um, next. 
uh, this is what the language, as I understand it, that I'm proposing would change to, so that just the higher stories have that setback, since for the first three stories, you're already at the 20 feet. Um, why would you then suddenly shift all those back? Um, next. Um, the reasoning um, has to do with economic feasibility of the construction, especially since Arlington has a lot of small lots, especially in the business districts. Um, if a parcel is zoned to allow four or five stories already and they're separate height and story restrictions that are in other parts for different types of business districts, um, if you're already allowed to go with four stories, if you have to then shrink the entire footprint of the building an extra 10 feet in these small lots, it may prevent the economic feasibility and harm the ability to grow small businesses. So the example here is you have a parcel that has a width or a building that has a width of 100 feet, a depth of 60 feet. Uh, for three stories, that would be 18,000 square feet. Uh, with the current zoning, if you wanted a fourth floor, you have to decrease the depth for all the stories. Uh, so you'd only get 20,000 square feet. So you'd only get a net increase of 2,000 square feet for all the construction costs to go to four stories. And that doesn't even include um, you know, um, points of egress, maybe elevators, things that would take up more of the space. Uh, with the proposed amendment, this would change to um, allowing, let me see if I read this right. Uh, you would be able to get uh, 23,000 square feet total. Um, so since you can get an extra 3,000 square feet on the top floor, uh, relative to status quo, it could be economically feasible. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, I think I stated this basically already, but we want to make it so where extra stories are allowed in the business districts already. We want the floor plate to be useful and economically um, financially viable. Um, existing zoning already sets different story heights for a reason. Um, and this change shouldn't have any impacts on shadows since for three story building, you already are allowed to have just a 20 foot setback. If you're adding the extra higher stories that already in the existing zoning are 30 foot back, I don't think it should change shadows towards the adjacent residential. Uh, next. Um, just for comparison, uh, in Somerville's form zoning code, they do basically the same thing. Uh, Mid-rise is the equivalent to our business district or mixed uh, use districts. Um, and their neighborhood residential is similar to our R0, R1, and R2. And they have the same thing where the first, first to third stories abutting neighborhood residential is 20 foot setback, rear setback, and then everything higher is 30 foot setback. Um, I think that's it. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I will turn it over to the board for any questions or comments, starting with Ken. Um, I generally don't have any questions. I'm supportive of this. Uh, I should be very much supportive of this. I do have one suggestion uh, graphically. When yes. you have your section right there, yes. see the vertical line? Uh, we measure off 20 feet and 30 feet. Yes. You just, just rotate some text there, say property line. Just makes it easier. Oh, okay. Just, it's just minor. It's very minor. Okay? Yeah. Just so people realize that pole is not really up. It's the proper line between yes. residential and yeah. Otherwise, why you, I, when I first looked at, it, I thought it was different pictures. You know, there's a house and it's a. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Great. Thank you, Ken. Shana. Um, I think this is very thoughtful. I have no questions. Uh, Jean. No questions. Either. Steve. Um, I, I appreciate that this um, is likely to all, you know, provide for some more ground space, ground floor commercial space and mixed use, and I'm supportive. I concur with my colleagues. Uh, so at this time, we will open um, up the floor for public comment for Article 33. Anyone uh, wishes to uh, speak, please raise your hand. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Carl Wagner, uh, 30 Edgehill Road. and. Uh, town meeting member. Um, I'd like to uh, read a, a, an email that came from an engineer who reviewed this. If one were to apply the horizontal scale to the height of the supposed buildings, it would lead to the amazing conclusion that a typical story is only five and a half feet high. The blue business district four-story buildings should actually be about 50 feet tall more than twice as high as they are shown. And the unlabeled side yard setback for the house 
that's the left to right horizontal side back, is drawn at essentially a generous 13 feet rather than the 5 to 10 feet that is typical for East Arlington. I would ask, Madam Chair and members of the board, that the diagrams and graphics, as well as all information that are supporting uh, the proposal, be given to you in proper scale. Uh, that's the first thing that, that one sees. I would also point out that in this very room, prior to the special town meeting, um, the major changes that resulted in the status quo that the proponent is hoping to make even larger, uh, those changes didn't have any public input after the, the, the Springtown meeting before. There was no chance for the public to weigh in. Why is it so important? Well, if you have business district next to business district or business next to business, it's not so important. But the residents pay the taxes. They're the ones who come home from jobs here. And the residents are that red house on the left. They're the people who are going to be incredibly inconvenienced with solar panels and shading if we get this wrong. The applicant has given you a deceptive, perhaps unintentionally deceptive graphic, and the, the situation deserves to be studied better by us and the people who might live in these uh, houses and buildings that are next to uh, business districts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? Please. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I'm going to leave my mask on because totally fine I have if you this can just head cold going on. Please just project sure. as much as you can. Thank sure, you. Sure, sure. Um, I want to uh, actually echo Mr. Wagner's comments. I um, we had quite uh, I don't know fraught is the right term, but the town meeting last year, the special town meeting dealing with the MBTA Communities Act, was a significant effort and caused significant consternation in town. It came to a subtle conclusion, unlike Milton, but it, uh, it did happen. And I'm thinking that continued work of this manner, chipping away at the various current zoning rules relative to height, setbacks, um, and the pressure between business interests versus residential interests that Mr. Leiter just laid out, I'm thinking that probably this is too quickly re-engaging on issues that were already discussed at last year's town meeting and brought to conclusion with significant discussion. Um, I'm not sure why we're engaging on this again so quickly, these sorts of issues so quickly after just having settled what was a somewhat divisive situation. And I think we need to have <coughs> a bit of a safe harbor approach to changes for a bit after last year. Um, I'm not, I know that there are certain things that we need to continue to do year after year and continue to work on uh, evolving things. But this sounds an awful lot like what I heard last year. And I would recommend that the board uh, perhaps not consider taking a vote of approval of this so quickly after last year's special time. Thank you. Any other comments? Please. When I live in Orchard Place, um, I, I think one thing about zoning changes in Arlington is so much of Arlington is non-conforming, and I question this uh, in areas where the rear setbacks of the abutting residential property are not the required 20 feet. For instance, my backyard, which does not abut a potential B district, but my backyard is about 14 or 15 feet deep uh, on a very, very small lot. And there are many, many lots, many parcels like this in town, particularly in East Arlington. Um, and, and to point out, the scale on that is a little bit off because a four-story building, business building, would probably be closer to 50 feet. Um, and for a residence with a, a short, uh, less deep backyard, that's going to be really a looming presence. Um, that's that's going to be all you see when you look out of some of your windows. So I think that without taking non-conforming lots into consideration, this, this needs quite a bit more thought. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, any other comments? Please.
Ratnakur Venanki, uh, 21 Adam Street. Um, I'm speaking in support of this uh, amendment. Uh, I think it's it's a common sense amendment. Uh, it clarifies the bylaw changes that were already made last year. Uh, that's one. Uh, and two, I think, uh, as the department already explained, uh, as the applicant, sorry, uh, it gives further uh, scope uh, to, to add commercial space, and we need that. We need that new growth. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Please. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Crystal Reddy, 6 Adam Street. Um, just a few comments on this one. I, I thought when we adopted this change at town meeting last fall, it was the um, Somerville regulations, you know, verbatim. And I'm not sure for which zoning district in Somerville they before. Um, I'm not sure why they need to change, not why they changed in Somerville. But um, that's my first question. Um, if they were good enough last fall, why aren't they good enough now? The second is, um, you know, I appreciate Mr. Wagner's comments on the scale. If you're going to do a drawing, you need to get and put dimensions on it. You need to make them scale both in the horizontal and vertical dimensions. The other thing I would add is that typically the backyard, rear yard in the business district is the side yard in the residential district. And typically the side yard setbacks for existing homes is more like five feet. And that's way smaller than what is shown on this drawing. And I think the, the buildings themselves in the business district should be shown at their maximum height, um, not some artificial, artificially lowered height. Um, Another thing this introduces is the in inconsistency in the terminology in the bylaw. What is now being referred to as a upper story setback is what you call a step back in other contexts. And um, I think you, you need to deal with that issue as well. That you've got two different, you know, so you've got setbacks and step backs, and you're, you're going to cause a lot of confusion as this is written. And then finally, my final comment is the same as I had on for the MBTA Communities Act bylaw change. And that again, as far as I understand it, this bylaw change from last fall has not, bylaw change from last fall has not yet been approved by the Attorney General. Again, there was a defect in the, in the notice for the hearing on it. And if, if I understand the procedure correctly, if anyone objects to the town clerk within a couple of weeks, she can't approve it. So again, can we, can we approve a bylaw change for the bylaw that hasn't yet been changed? So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? All right. With that, we will uh, close public. One, one second. Uh, we'll close uh, public comment for um, Article 33, and I'll see if um, there are any uh, questions from the members of the board. And then we'll um, uh, allow you to make any any clarifications you would like to. Starting with uh, Steve. Uh, nothing here. Jean. Nothing. Shana. Nothing. Ken. No. Um, yeah, just a few things. Um, I consulted with, uh, checked with a uh, member of our ARB about the language regarding setback and step back. I'm pretty sure it's consistent. There's just different terminology because there's no step back for rear yard, so it's a setback. So it's consistent as far as I know. Um, regarding the question of relative size, I can change that for the diagram, but at the end of the day, currently you can build to the 20 feet with three stories already. So whether it's looming or not, that exists in these areas in the status quo. So this is just letting you have the higher part of the building be stepped back to what I think is good for being near residential. I think I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you for the clarifications. All right, um, at this point, Jean, did you have anything else? Okay, um, at this point we will um, end uh, comment on Article 33, thank you so much. Can you take up that for Yes, um, I have a request for a um, quick, uh, quick recess. Um, we will uh, reconvene in um, five minutes. Perfect, thank you very much. We're going to get started again, please. Thank you.
All right. Um, so at this time, we'd like to open the uh, public hearing for Article 34, the zoning bylaw amendment related to residential uses. And I will see if um, Claire Ricker from the Department of Planning and Community Development has any introductory comments. Thanks very much. No um, introductory uh, comments from the um, uh, from the department. Um, this was submitted by um, JP Wilicki. Yep. All right. Uh, and 10 registered voters. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so you will have up to five minutes to introduce the article. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have quite a lot of prepared material, so hopefully uh, uh, won't necessarily get to all of it right here. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the board for uh, their guidance when we met through last time. I think that's helped us uh, refine our proposal. Um, I very much appreciate that. Um, kind of, again, for the benefit of everyone, um, we're proposing to allow both two family and three family dwellings by right throughout Arlington. Um, and to do that while keeping all the existing dimensional requirements in place. So, setbacks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you actually go to the next slide, or, um, one, uh, one more. Um, so we were a little unsure on our approach last time. Um, there's kind of just been a question on the quantum of vote for town meeting. And uh, we found your comments very persuasive that it wouldn't make sense to go ahead with three family without um, allowing two family in those districts. Um, so that's, uh, regardless of the effect with the quantum of vote, uh, we're going to keep that in there. Okay. Um, also, um, we found your comments on site plan review uh, likewise persuasive. Uh, we would like to incorporate it, uh, however, uh, at the point when the current draft language of the article was submitted, uh, we didn't have um, a proposed set of, war of language for that. Um, but if you go to the next slide, uh, we were considering going with an approach like this, where there'd be kind of an asterisk or something in the use table, and there'd be a note that site plan review would be required. Um, I know there was some discussion um, in some of your earlier meetings about kind of what the rules and regulations for site plan review should be and to kind of allow that to be used in other circumstances in the zoning bylaw. Um, we think this would be a good approach, but we're, we very much would like to be guided by you and what language you'd like to see. Um, and kind of, in our opinion, it's something that makes sense to include for kind of new uh, two-family development in R0 and R1, and new three-family development in all three districts. Um, unfortunately, the, the biggest question by far for this has been the question of quantum of vote. Um, the state's housing choice law uh, uh, is intended to kind of make it easier to have uh, three-family by right, roll, uh, rolled out throughout the state. Uh, it's been a little bit unclear to us uh, whether that applies to also allowing two family. Um, town council is consulting with the attorney general's office on it. Um, and it's, so far it's gonna be our, our intent to withdraw it if it comes back as a two thirds requirement. Um, and uh, we'll We'll be the first to let you know uh, when we hear. Um, so uh, I can go more in depth on the projections, but basically I tried to do an exercise similar to what Steve put together for MPTA communities last fall uh, to kind of go through at the parcel level and simulate development, um, kind of most trying to use similar assumptions around um, the basic development rate would be twice the rate for um, existing teardowns, complete redevelopments, um, with a variety of other modifiers. Um, I, I it's kind of a little bit of a uh, I I had it all uh, got it all working, but um, the difference between. Steve's projections and these projections 
is that there are so many fewer parcels for the MBTA Communities District that the randomness of the draw um, really actually provides the spread in outcomes. Um, so th there's a slide a little bit later on um, showing kind of the expected developments by year and it's just a straight line and that's just a, a product of the fact that you've got uh, so many thousands of units to draw from. Um, in reality, we expect it to be uh, noisier on a year basis, um, and also uh, that the you, just, you basically get very close to the original assumptions that um, I think it was like 0.46 percent chance that as the base assumption, and after all the modifiers and after everything else, um, you get like a 0.48 percent chance. So it's kind of uh, I, I thought it was, it was interesting. Uh, I was kind of assuming uh, I think probably more uh, would be, so basically when I was going through the projections, we were assuming. Um, do, you, do you want us to show the results slide? Would that be? Yeah, helpful? probably, yeah. Let's we'll probably okay, just give the results. If and, you have questions, we can get into that. No, 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 that's totally fine. Um, I, and I know we're at five minutes already. I know that a lot of these are in question answering questions that the board had during our last meeting, so I'm inclined to um, allow it an additional five minutes if the other board members are in agreement. Is there any objection okay. from the board members? No. Any objection? Okay, please okay. go ahead. Great. Um, so uh, this again is um, kind of off of those assumptions. You get 560 um, parcels total redeveloped over uh, those that 10 year period. Um, 726 new dwelling units, uh, et cetera. Um, I think the, the important takeaway from that, this is that if you want to have a different assumption on the pace of redevelopment, if you think, okay, hey, that, that the twice the, <laughs> if that's too conservative, uh, this is a small enough fraction then redeveloped that you can actually just multiply by whatever rate you think applies. So if you think, okay, well, go full 10 times or whatever uh, that you, you can just kind of extrapolate uh, from here. Um, okay. um, so yeah, I think we could, I'd be glad to answer any more questions on the projections later on, but probably better take detailed ones. Um, Andy, you can talk a little bit yeah, about the... So, so I had a conversation with Dana Man in the assessor's office um, and similar to the conversation I had with him about multifamily housing in general last year, it's really clear that if there are more units in the building, the valuation goes up and the tax revenue goes up. So a three family of the same size is going to have more value and therefore going to produce more tax revenue than a single family. What he can't predict, what the town manager can't predict, what nobody can really predict is what will the effect be on expenses. Most of our expenses don't increase as headcount increases, but there are notable exceptions, and those notable exceptions are schools and trash collection. And both of those are expensive items in the budget. So um, that is the best answer anybody can give you, similar to MBTAC, is that there's going to be some effect um, but there's no way to calculate whether or not we're going to be at a tax advantage or we're going to be neutral or we're going to be at a tax disadvantage. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Ken had expressed kind of interest in seeing how this would work. Um, uh, I think first of all the fact that we're allowing two family throughout uh, Arlington. Uh, if you have a law where um, floor plans and such wouldn't work uh, for three family. I think that there was a certain amount more flexibility. Uh, but we did try to, to find kind of some examples of existing uh, three family units um, as well as kind of potentially how a larger single family could be adapted. Um, I just have a couple pictures on the next few slides. Um, but yeah, so 68 Water Street um, uh, is an existing three family unit, um, so I think it's eight bedrooms, um, kind of can be done in keeping, uh, and again, you'll, you'll note this with the two and a half story, um, like third floor is just a half story, uh, so 
kind of possible to do it without a full third story. Um, the next one, Nine Rolls of Terrace. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one of the questions with all of these is sort of um, whether you can do it within the existing setback. I mean, this is a little bit short, but again, it's very much in keeping with the neighborhood. I, I biked by it a million times without realizing it was a three-family house. Um, and finally, um, five Old Ham Terrace, um, Old Ham Road, sorry. Um, that this is a larger single family, uh, that it would be possible in a kind of a larger lot and a lot, um, with a larger building to, uh, to do three separate dwelling units in a kind of harmonious manner that matches the, the neighborhood. Um, so yes, then uh, we have a plan for public engagement uh, that we've been trying to wait to get the guidance at the bottom of the vote before we go and tell everyone this is happening for sure. Uh, but as soon as we get the word, we'll be doing early outreach to all town meeting members, uh, right, um, trying to in the newspaper, uh, coordinating an event that's open to the public. Uh, we'll also make sure that we've got coverage for attending all the different precinct meetings. Uh, to your uh, resident concerns and to represent what the article's about. Um, and I mean, I guess I would just say overall too, like we would love to hear your concerns with the uh, article and how it should be drafted. Um, and even if it's not something that you kind of support currently, um, we would love to hear either what changes the language or what kind of process around this uh, would make it something you can support in the future. Great. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Let's start with uh, Ken for any questions or comments. I uh, appreciate you uh, showing some examples of, uh, of what you think uh, the buildings will look like uh, falling, staying within the setbacks. So the examples you set, you've shown meet all the setback requirements. They're not, they're not existing, non-conforming. So those buildings are meeting all setbacks and all, all size ramifications, and those are three families right now. Okay, that, that's much appreciated. With, with the exception of five old ham, which is just an eight thousand square foot single family, I think we just showed that example as this could easily be modified to be a this one here. Family. Yeah, this one without you really noticing that it was a three family structure. Okay. Because um, it certainly has the floor plate to do it. And already has a three-car garage that's around the side. Um, McMansion, basically. Yeah, so, well, it's one of, I could have pulled ten of these, but it seemed like pulling real three families was a better idea. So. No, I, I agree with you. Um, um, to be honest, I'm a little hesitant right now, okay, just because uh, MBA communities just passed, or will pass, Chris. Oh. <laughs> uh, but I just want to see how that develops. And the fact that there has not been very much public engagement. And I realize you acknowledge the fact that you're waiting. I think uh, we should have that because uh, when you're doing MBTA communities, there was quite a bit of public engagement. Uh, heated, yes, but there was a lot of it, okay? And I think that will help uh, craft this thing. And um, so that's my little reservation saying that if there was, I would just wait. And if, if you guys could wait, because you, you guys don't even have a decision is this going to be a, a, a super majority or just a majority right now, right? Yeah. And it's, I would just wait, see what that decision is, and then uh, start your public engagement and see how that, with the public engagement, how that uh, alters what you plan here. And it may enrich it, I think it will. Thank you, Ken. Shana. Um, so, so one of the things that I noticed was the description of R0 and R1 talked about um, discouraging intensive land use and um, I'm 
here in the ear. Uh, and so I'm wondering, I'm wondering if uh, that is that is something that would need to be revised um, with this. If if going to a three-family house um, would be considered an intensive land use. Um, another question I had was where the physical overlap with MBTA communities neighborhood districts are. Um, I think that might have an interesting impact on um, on unit count, on, on magnitude of unit count. Uh, are we uh, so so you know if are we talking about the whatever it was 50 units a year um, the MBTA communities estimated plus 72 units or or is it you know 50 plus 20 um, and and then I would echo can the the public outreach or lack thereof I think is going to be very important um, so those are my three thoughts thank you Shana Jean thanks um, and thanks for bringing this to us so we can discuss it I'm going to ask a couple questions about your analysis of the results then go through um, some pieces of your draft and ask some questions about it and, and then give overall thought about it. So on the results, you indicate that if nothing happens in 10 years, 560 parcels will get redeveloped. But if this goes into effect, there'll be 726 additional. So can you go to the results page? Next, that, yeah, back, uh, yeah, back one. Sorry. Back one. Back one. Back one? The summary. Yeah. The yes, results, that one. That's 726 thank you. units. So is that, that's unclear wording, basically. Okay, what, so what in, in, all of, in, in all of the stuff, uh, so this slide and the previous slide, it, I'm referring to kind of additional incremental units. Um, uh, the stuff we're saying additional on, per year. On top of the 506. Uh, no, so if you, if you actually look at the, these, fig these figures are just taken from the, the previous one. Uh, so the first line, total redeveloped parcels, that means uh, parcels that were redeveloped due to this change, and that we're assuming move from R0 or R1 to, to or that, that move from single family to two or three. Uh, okay, so, okay so if these are just those, even if the 560 all became two families, help me with the math, 1,120, so how do you get to... 726. So if a, if a single family becomes a, a three family, for example, then uh, one parcel could become two dwelling units in that sense. In the vein of MBTA communities, right? Yeah. This is the right, new so units only created. So a single family is one. So, you know, 560, if they were all two family, the number would be 560 new dwelling units in your assuming that a certain amount are three families, so they're adding two instead of okay. one. So this is on top of one. And the, yeah, this yeah. Is the single family well. that already well, exists. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I found this confusing yep. to, and that just might be me and not you. No, it's, uh, it's helpful to talk through it. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> it. It's interesting. There was a report that came out, I think, the end of last year looking at Minneapolis. And as you know, Minneapolis got yep. rid of single family zoning. And the report basically said getting rid of single family zoning had almost no impact in Minneapolis. And all of the increased housing was sort of exactly what we did with MBTA communities on the main thoroughfare, larger, and not just getting rid of single family zoning. So on the one hand, your numbers may be too high if we are similar to Minneapolis, on the other hand, if we're similar to Minneapolis, this may not really be necessary to do at all. So I'm, I'm, I'm mixed about what to do about, about that. Um, I agree with Shana. If you're going to do this, you need to rewrite the 
R0, R1, and R2 definitions as opposed to just crossing out a few little things can about you, them. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. So why does the number of units in the building equate to more intensive land use if the dimensions are the same? I don't understand that. Well, all right. So I'm, I'm not getting out of bed. If you look at these three, there's virtually no difference now between R0 and R1 except for the minimum lot size, but oh. it doesn't quite line up there, and, you, and pretty similar with R2. So I'd say you could do better in rewriting these three. On, um, let me go to the next one. On the, on, I like the idea if this is gonna go forward with site plan review. My suggestion, it's just a suggestion, <coughs> is rather than put an asterisk, because there are too many asterisks already. Just create a new thing, SPR, and then you put SPR in, and then add, add SPR to the, um, the table where it says what each of these things are. Then you don't have to have one asterisk, two asterisk, or one asterisk. It's just, I think, a cleaner way of, of, dealing, of dealing with that. Um, one of, one of the things when you came a few weeks ago that I mentioned, and I'm still interested in it, I spoke to a couple of people and said, what do you think about this idea that you're proposing? And they said, I'd feel better about it if they all looked like single family homes, right? So I wonder about the utility of putting something in here that says they have to resemble single family homes. Um, so I'd like you to think about, about that um, also. And um, getting, now I'm getting to where Ken was, which is what I said last time. I just wonder whether this is premature in that we haven't even implemented MBTA communities yet. We're not going to see what that looks like for another year or two. Maybe it makes sense to wait and see what is the development in the neighborhood district. Would that influence what this looks like? You know, so I think it might be worth not saying no, never to this, but making some of the some changes and waiting to see what happens in the next couple of years with MBTA communities and whether this makes sense under those circumstances. So that's where I am at the moment. Thank you, Gene. Steve. Well, first, I'd uh, like to uh, express some appreciation for what I felt was a, a good effort towards answering all of the questions that we asked you the last time. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. I, just as a, as a note, regarding the, um, you know, the, the, the variability between the runs, I kind of, I see why you ended up that way because there's a lot less variability in what you can, uh, what this would allow uh, versus what the range of parcels under MBTA communities would allow. Um, so that, that totally makes sense. The one substantive suggestion I would make is that um, site plan review not be required for two family. And I believe, if I remember the discussion, you know, the previous discussion, what, it went something to the effect of, well, we re, we're requiring site plan review for multifamily in the MBTA district, so it would make sense for, um, you know, for, th for three families, so it would make sense for multifamily elsewhere. Um, so I, I would ask you to consider you know, removing the requirement for two, but keeping the one for three. I agree, I forgot to mention that. Can I mention one other thing I forgot? Please, go for it. it this is your big opportunity to change three-family dwelling to a Y in the R3 district, and you didn't do it. Well, we, we totally would have made that change, and we, we appreciated that input. We had unfortunately had already set the warrant article language uh, by the time we're, we came before you. Uh, yeah, but yes, no, I very much would have. <laughs> Any other comments or questions from the 
members of the board? No. Okay. Uh, so at this point, we will uh, open up discussion for Article 34 uh, for public comment. Anyone wishing to speak, please raise your hand, and I'll ask you to um, please come sit in the seat right here so the microphone can pick you up. Please. Caitlin Monaghan, 43 Highland. I really love this idea. I think it would be great. Um, the one thing I think might be helpful in terms of giving people an idea of how much it would change things is if there were some way to analyze how many houses, how many current single family or two family houses actually go all the way like to the limit they're allowed to according to the setbacks versus how many they actually have some logo room because I think depending on what that, those numbers are, that might give us a better idea of whether there's likely to be a bunch of development or if it'll be more of a Minneapolis situation. Great. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else wishing to speak this evening? Thank you. Uh, Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road, and uh, a, a town meeting member. Uh, this uh, article looks similar to the article that proposed getting rid of single family zoning a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm distressed to see that it is back so soon. Uh, at the time, the proposal to get rid of single family, uh, and this would get rid of two family zoning by adding three in both cases, was saying ostensibly that it would uh, improve affordability, it would help our green efforts, our climate resiliency, and it would add to diversity. Uh, in town meeting, it was shown that it would do none of those things. And this would probably do none of those things also. Green, uh, trees, uh, open permeable spaces are lost to a desperate effort to get cars or vehicles, any place they can be, front yard, side yard, backyard. Uh, we would see uh, the loss uh, um, in affordability, as you probably know, in all cases when single families were turned into two families where they were allowed in Arlington, the individual unit price of the two units was more individually than the, the single family that was knocked down to do that. We care about affordability for diverse people, for people who are coming in and looking for the, the, the affordable solution for them. And, and diverse people are not looking to pay more for one of a three-decker uh, than they would for a single family. Let's also talk about choice. Housing choice was the name of a recent bill that the old governor put in place. They should have a choice, we should have a choice, to stay in Arlington as we move from uh, multi-units, big buildings, to two uh, units like condos, and then to single families, potentially. People want two and one family units, and they want to keep their kids in the same town if they can. As they change their income or as they get married, they might be able to afford a two family or a one family. They might be able to just move directly to those. We owe it to Arlington not to put radical choices out so quickly after MBTA communities. We owe it to at least have a vote on such a major change, and especially before we get rid of the diversity of housing stock, the affordability, and the green uh, efforts that we're already making to keep our open spaces open. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Please. Again, Steve Moore, I'm quickly learning that I probably shouldn't follow Mr. Wagner since he uh, takes my thunder. Sorry. No, no, I, uh, I just want to echo what he has just said, much like I did on the last article. Um, I thought it was just last year we discussed the removing of the uh, uh, R1 zone in, in town, and uh, not a couple of years ago, and as the board has uh, already mentioned a number of times, um, this is following very quickly on the heels of that before we have the chance to even see what happens with what we did last year, which was radical change for the town. Um, a lot of people think it went the right way, a lot of people think it went the wrong way, but be that as it may, I think this is premature. I think it's tone deaf considering the discourse that we had last year so recently to come back and do this so quickly. Again, I'm not sure why that's occurring. Um, it just, it, I think, again, I use the term safe harbor. I think we need hands off for this for a couple of years to see what happens. And I think the board should consider that in any position they take. 
Great. Thank you. Any other comments, please? Susan Stamps, 39 Grafton Street. Um, I, I do agree with the idea that, well, we just did MBTA community, so maybe we want to wait a year or two. Um, but I do love the idea of being able to make these um, uh, regular size houses into two and three families. Um, it, it, we're already tearing, tearing down small houses and building McMansions in Arlington. And it just is maddening to see that this is for one family. It's happening anyway. We don't seem to be able to stop it. And so if we're, if we might as well give developers the opportunity to, to make a home for three families in one of these monstrosity, you know, I won't talk to say monstrosity, but large uh, homes, um, rather than one. So um, I think it's a great idea. I do worry about is this going to mean more uh, paving over for driveways, but there may be something that can be done about that. Maybe there's permeable pavement, maybe there's a limitation on pavement, I don't know. I think it's it's definitely, or you're maybe just have dirt driveways. How about that for an idea or gravel? Um, so I think it's uh, definitely an, an exciting idea. I don't think it can happen too soon. This is a very different attitude than I had when the two-family by right came up a few, few years ago. I was like, oh, no, it's you know, paved over and everything. But I see what's happening, and I think it's a great solution to providing more housing. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Grant Cook, Precinct 16. Um, you mentioned the Minneapolis situation of, of eliminating single family zoning, and you were right. They said the single family change wasn't that much of the impact. Mm -hmm. What was an impact was eliminating parking minimums, which was something you all fought to keep in the MBTA discussion. And I think at some point you said you would deal with it. So I guess I'm looking forward to you actually dealing with it. Not this, I mean, I assume not this year, but. It is something that had a great impact in Minneapolis, and I hope that's something you guys take seriously when you said you would address it as a consideration. The larger buildings, not. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I, mean, I know the details of Minneapolis, but to talk about the impact for eliminating parking minimums was the biggest thing they felt. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we have to argue with, you know, this change versus the status quo. There was a, a small house that went on sale in the center single family on a posted size piece of land. I think half the house didn't have heat and it pri priced at $800,000. I mean, that's for a single family that's gonna need significant work. That's the status quo. Now, do we change this now? I don't know, but the status quo is pretty bad. So I hope we, we act steadily to improve things. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? No. Uh, Don Gersh, uh, Kipling Road. I, I would just like to say Ed, that uh, I would feel way better about this if there was a, a safe way to present this that would garner a two-thirds majority. If you could make a persuasive enough case, if a case could be made for a two-third majority that would convince a two-third majority, I would feel like way better about something like this than if the system is sort of kind of being game to play the 50% majority thing. I, that's all. Thank you. Uh, yes. <coughs> Wendy Richter, um, Brattle Place. Um, I am a affordable housing advocate, and I feel that this um, particular proposal will not feed into uh, increased affordability. Um, and I see that from a couple of different angles. Um, I think that um, 
perhaps if existing houses were allowed to be turned into multifamily and there was a process to do that, that would be not what this proposal is, but if there were a process for that, I could see that providing some affordability. Um, I have, I'm an architect and I know what developers do in terms of you take a property, land is very expensive here, and you maximize it and you make the biggest units you can, and I see that as, as building out lots, and if you go to the R1 uh, and 2, building out those lots for three families, you're gonna end up with very expensive three family uh, units. Um, I think the idea of being able to have the houses still appear as single families, but that doesn't usually happen when it comes down to design, because people want their own front door, they want their own uh, house. And um, I think that if you're converting an existing single family that's large, it's going to look really different than a new building that is built on a lot that maximizes the footprint and minimizes the open space. So thanks. Thank you. Other comments? You had your hand up. Hi, Ruth Nakar Wolenki, 21 Adams Street. Um, I'm in support of this uh, article, uh, and I hope it makes it through and, and passes. Um, I beg to differ from some of the members of the board that this is too soon to the MBTA communities, uh, because I think we don't need to limit ourselves and give a quota of only one every f one change or one bylaw change every five years or so if that benefits the town, right? We don't need to limit ourselves from doing something that will benefit the town, right? Um, and two, more importantly, I think we need to use all levers possible. MBTA community was one level. We need to use all levers possible to A, resolve the housing crunch, but B, more importantly, to better the town's finances. This is very, very good for town's finances. Uh, three units of 1,000 square feet produce more property taxes than one unit of 3,000 square feet, right? So we need to remember that. So three units of 1,000 square feet produce more property taxes than one unit of 3,000 square feet, right? Two, renovations and changes obviously will not be subject to prop, prop two and a half, and that will be added to new growth. So this is, very beneficial for town's finances, which, by the way, have been struggling, right? The town has been paying, ha was paying 4% of the median household income 15 years ago as property taxes. Now we pay 7% of the median household income as property taxes. The reason why we ended up there is because we don't have new growth, right? <coughs> so this is very, very beneficial for the town's finances. So we shouldn't stop ourselves from using all levers to improve town's finances and also resolve housing crunch. Another uh, reason why this is important, why we should do this, is because uh, this actually opens up housing <coughs> choice rather than curtailing housing choice. Another number I'd like to give is the average household size in Arlington in the last 50 years has reduced from 3.3 to 2.2 or so, right? So this back in 1970 US Census, an average household in Arlington had around 3.2 members. Now it's only 2.2, so the household sizes have reduced, which means we need more households to house the same amount of people, which we haven't been doing. So people out there in the market want, for the reduced household, they want more units, multifamily units, right? And we need to respond to that as well. And as a result of that, the town's population has reduced from 54,000 in 1970 to just 46,000 now. That's a 13% decrease in the town's population, while the Commonwealth's population has increased 24%. So we haven't produced enough houses, and as a result, our population is reduced, and the town's finances are also under duress, right? So what I'm seeing as a summary is that just because we did something last year in MBTA communities shouldn't stop us from doing something else that will be beneficial for this town for all of the current residences, residents, and town finances, and in the process, help housing prices. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else, please? Thank you. 
when Al Evans wants your place, uh, just a, a brief comment. I hope that all of you, if you have not, will take the, the time to read the op-ed in the Globe today by State Senator Lydia Edwards and James Jennings, who is a professor of environmental and land use policy at Tufts, in which they make the excellent point that production does not equal equity. And that if we are going to create truly equitable housing, we need to do a lot more than simply produce more units. And my objection to this um, proposal is that it focuses entirely on production. Um, and as others have pointed out, developers who are in business to make money, as they should be, are going to build the highest priced units they possibly can within the limitations that the town imposes. This is not going to aid affordability. It is not going to give choice to the people who are struggling right now to stay here or to put <coughs> foot into the real estate market. So for that reason, I would, I would definitely vote against this as a town meeting member. Um, and I think that in general, we need to really consider much more broadly how to make Arlington welcoming. It's not simply a matter of production. There's a lot more that we, we need to, to be thinking about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please. Rebecca Gruber, 215 Pleasant Street. Um, when I, I read that editorial as well, um, I read it to understand that production is good, but not enough. <laughs> so we have to do both. Um, I want to bring to um, everyone's attention 149 Pleasant Street. It's on the corner of Gray and Pleasant. It's a very dilapidated ranch. It happens to be R4. <laughs> and so the proposal that I saw go to the Historic District Commission is for it to be rebuilt as a three family. So there's appetite on this huge lot to replace something that's pretty darn ugly. The plans look lovely. They look like they fit into the uh, aesthetics of other buildings on Pleasant Street that are, some of them are two family and some of them are single family. And I think that it's a shame that it's only that corner that a three family can be built on, not on every lot that has the size and the space to do so. Thank you. Any other comments? Great, thank you all for your participation in um, that public comment. Um, at this time, we will close public comment for Article 34, and I will turn it uh, back to the board for any other uh, questions um, or uh, items that they'd like to convey to the proponents of uh, Article 34. Starting with Ken. Uh, no, I'm all set. Great. Shana? Nothing. Jean? Yeah, I think this was a really good discussion. It reminded me that until I was 13, my family lived in what had once been a single family home that was converted to three units. And we lived in, crammed into one of the three units. It's true, you know, until my parents made enough money to move out and buy the single family Gene. home. So I, so I definitely appreciate this. And I'm really torn on um, what to do about this. I'd like you to consider some of the things that I suggested. I also wonder, based on what a couple people said, if a short-term step would be to have this for conversion of existing homes as opposed to new homes as, as a first step and see. I'm not suggesting, I'm just suggesting you take a look at it and see whether it's an interim step that met, makes sense. Thank you, Jean. Did you want to reply to that? I didn't want to reply to Jean, but I wonder if I can make a general comment and reply. Sure, if you don't mind, I'll, 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 I'll um, ask Steve for his comments and then we'll invite you to, to make any comments. I just, Jean, I just would say, We'd love to discuss the language for what that could look like with you. Uh, I mean, it might not be, I think, with amending uses in the Warren article, we may not be able to cover that in our existing Warren article, but we'd love okay, to discuss. Take a look. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I have nothing Steve. further, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, did you have any um, clarifications that you would like to make? Well, okay. I'm going to stand up because I don't talk very loud unless I stand up. <laughs> um, so I, I would like to say that in terms of the, the 
question of it being too soon to bring an article. You know, we are fully aware that it can be bruising on town meeting. We were both town meeting members. We went through that bruising. Well, I don't know. You're going to be soon, maybe, so get used to it. Um, and, and so, hence our concern about fighting for a two-thirds vote. And I think from the feedback that we've heard from the board tonight, it feels like maybe we need to do some more cooking, and maybe we need to do some more public engagement, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to be surprised when you take your vote uh, one way or the other. Um, and I'm not going to be upset about it. But what I would like to add is um, some thoughts about this question of community impact and affordability. Okay? So no, this is not an article about affordable housing. I worked for Youth Bill for four years. I worked for the um, Housing Partnership Network for four years. I've built with Habitat for Humanity for 20 years. And I have many, many clients in my current information systems practice that are affordable housing organizations. I know what affordable housing means. That's not what this is about. This is about production and filtering. Yes, somebody could buy a little house across the street from me for $800,000. They're not going to do that. The next house across the street from me that gets bought, a nice little six room ranch, is going to be bought by a developer for $800,000 and they're going to build another 5,000 square foot house that's going to house one family and going to sell itself for more than $2 million instead of two or three units that might sell for $800,000 or a million dollars a piece. That is more affordable than what is being produced in my neighborhood. People talk about the changing the character of the town. If you lived in my neighborhood, you would have seen what changing the character of a neighborhood means in the last 10 years. My neighborhood doesn't look anything like the neighborhood I moved into anymore because there are, are, are conforming lots all around me and every time a house turns over it gets knocked down and turned into four or 5,000 square foot house. And that's fine. I'm just saying there should be an option for more units and therefore more families. And the families that can afford a million dollar house they can't buy in Arlington because the price is $2 million. They're looking for where they can afford. And in some of the places they're buying, they're buying houses that are more affordable and maybe they're renovating themselves. But those are houses in neighborhoods where somebody's being displaced. So the idea is that if we produce more housing here, yes, expensive housing, but more housing here, less displacement happens in other places where housing is naturally affordable. It's a regional system. So that's, that's the effect on equity. In terms of the environmental effect, Claire, if you would put up, back up the picture of, 20, of 5 Old Ham Road. Okay, if you'll indulge me, Rachel, I appreciate your letting me go back to the yep. slides. Okay. That house was built on a wood lot. Okay. And it was built on a woodlot, and next to it was a small house that at the same time, same developer, was turned into two large colonials. And then there's uh, the colonial that had always been there, and then up hill from that are two more large houses built on woodlots. Okay, so this doesn't preserve the environment. All right, what preserves the environment, what makes this look lovely and means it has green space around it and trees and so on and so forth, is the thing we're not changing which is the dimensional requirements and the setbacks. I fail to understand why it's more of an environmental impact if there are three families living in that building instead of one. And I hope I'm not being insulting to the folks who live at Five Old Ham Road. I'm sure they're lovely people. So that is the point, is give more people more choices, allow for a greater variety of housing stock in town, and make it easier for people who currently couldn't buy a house here to buy a house here so they're not buying a decrepit single family in Mattapan and renovating it and gentrifying yet another neighborhood that's displacing people who've lived there for generations but have never been able to afford to buy a house. But Andy, every you. time this is all This is not a back and forth. This is, the this same is an back answer. And forth. Excuse me. Two years ago, Excuse me. I appreciate you What's answering. Going on in I, appreciate, what she I appreciate that she is answering the question. Of, excuse me. I appreciate that she's answering the question about equity, which I think you have done. 
Were there any so, other clarifications that you were looking to make for no, the board? No, those were the big clarifications I was Thank looking you. to make. And um, I feel like this is a collaborative effort, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from you, and you know we'll move forward at whatever pace feels right to us collectively. Great. I do have one additional question for you sure. as to whether or not um, through town council you have gotten any feedback on the timing for the AG decision. We have not. I've sent him emails twice. I could try to call him in the I, morning. I know they're backed up, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Great. Thank you. Um, any other comments from the board before we move on? Steve? No. Nope. Jean? No. Gina? Nothing. And Kim? All right. Thank you very much. Um, that closes our discussion on uh, Article 34. Um, and brings us to the conclusion of our topics under the public hearing for warrant articles for 2024 I'm meeting for this evening um, we do have uh, one other night of our hearing scheduled for uh, March 18th uh, uh, of this uh, month and we uh, at, at that meeting will be uh, deliberating on all of the uh, warrant articles which we have heard um, and uh, voting to recommend action or no action on each one of those articles. So I would like to see if there is a motion from the board to continue uh, the, the uh, public hearing to the next scheduled date on March 18th, 2024. So motion. Second. We'll take a vote starting with Steve. Yes. Jean. Yes. Shana. Yes. Kim. Yes. And I may ask as well. We will continue the hearing for Warren Articles for 2024 town meeting to March 18th. Thank you all. Um, and we will now move to the next item on our agenda, which is open forum. And I would invite anyone who, if you could um, give everyone a minute or two who would like to, to leave so that we, <laughs> we uh, can hear anyone who uh, would, is interested in speaking at open forum. And I would ask that anyone who is uh, interested in speaking, if you could please indicate so by raising your hand. Okay, with that, we will close open forum, agenda item number three, and now move to agenda item number four, which is new business. And I'll turn it over to Director Rickert. Thank you very much, but there is no new business at this time. Okay, great. Uh, any new business from board members, starting with Steve? Uh, no. Jean? No. Shana? No. Ken? No. And I don't have any tonight as well, um, and therefore I will move to agenda item number five and see if there is a motion to adjourn. So motion. Second. We'll take a vote, starting with Steve. Yes. Jean. Yes. Shana. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you all for coming this evening. This meeting is adjourned.